Each era has its own rules, traditions, ideas about purity and beauty of the body. The reign of Victoria, Queen of Great Britain and Ireland, is of interest not only to historians. Many books and films recreate the alluring pictures of the time, elegant ladies' dresses, men in austere suits, court intrigue, all-consuming love and passion floating in the air. And behind the scenes of the beautiful picture of the Victorian era, which lasted from 1837 to 1901, remain dirty, stinky streets, diseases, infections, epidemics and lack of rules for maintaining personal body hygiene. Streets of 19th century England Sewage facilities did not appear in England until 1864. Before that, it was impossible to walk through the streets of the city. The smell from defecation was everywhere. People went to their rooms to relieve themselves, and pots of sewage were poured out of the windows. That's when balconies appeared on the houses. Passers-by hid under balconies in an effort to minimize the chance of being doused in sewage. Toilets also did not help the situation. Ammoniacal stench was coming from the pits, and fumes of hazardous substances were wafting over the Thames from the tanneries and factories. The streets and yards stank, they stank of feces and urine. Rivers and squares, churches and palaces stink, Patrick Suskind wrote in his creation perfumer. The construction of the sewers became the industrial wonder of the world. But before that, the English had to endure the great stench of 1858, when intense heat contributed to the decomposition of sewage and industrial waste. People had nothing to breathe. Fear of a repeat of such a horror and several outbreaks of cholera in the towns and suburbs prompted the authorities to begin building a sewage system designed by Joseph Baselgett. Today the first pumping stations in London are shown to tourists as one of the attractions. Personal Hygiene of the English by the mid-19th century, the English notions of cleanliness had changed somewhat. After all, in the 18th century they had a clear belief that washing the body could be the cause of disease. These Russian perverts, wash in the bath every week, was what Europeans visiting Russia used to say. But thanks to discoveries in microbiology and numerous publications in scientific journals, people have begun to think more about the cleanliness of their bodies. Subterfuge for Beauty in the Victorian era, men and women strived for beauty. But the ways in which attractiveness was achieved now seem very wild and dangerous to health. Hair was washed with ammonia diluted in water. This solution was recommended to be rubbed into the head once every 15 to 30 days. Ammonia is very aggressive when combined with water, and because of this property the solution effectively removes dirt from the hair and exfoliates the skin from the scalp, wrote writer Teresa O. Neal who studied Victorian life in detail. Hair became stiff after washing, and a special pomade was applied to it, which facilitated combing. The ladies took baths with arsenic to whiten their skin, without fear of the consequences. Pale skin was the pinnacle of perfection. Any means were good for the effect, and women ate, in small quantities, even waffles with poison to please men. Nowadays, work with arsenic involves mandatory protection and safety equipment. Leeches were also used to whiten the skin. Women went to ponds and reservoirs, did not disdain to collect slimy leeches, let them suck on their bodies and drink blood. The loss of blood did make the ladies' skin paler, but it did not add to their health. Freckles were bleached with citric acid. If that did not help, they used toxic carbolic acid, the fumes of which corroded the eyes, skin, and airways. Body hairs were removed with a paste of tree resin, which dried the skin and made it easy to remove unwanted vegetation. You can use bleach to remove body hair and then treat the skin with vinegar, wrote S. D. Austin in her 1874 book, Notes of an Ugly Girl, the harm of such a procedure was obvious. The teeth of the English were in a very bad condition. Lack of treatment, water with heavy metals was not conducive to whiteness and strength. Teeth were cleaned with a rag soaked in ammonia, later there were toothbrushes with horsehair bristles. Tooth powder should be added, charcoal, iris root, ground chalk, and lavender or bergamot oil, a recipe was published in the Dodge City Times in 1879. Such tooth powder was believed to cleanse the gums, strengthen tooth enamel, and make the breath fragrant and fresh. By the end of the century, quinine and carmine toothpastes began to appear. They quickly gained popularity and became a permanent means of dental care in wealthy families. Poor people could not afford such extravagances and simply rubbed their teeth and gums with salt, using their own fingers or cloths. Celery was chewed to keep the mouth fresh. If teeth rotted to the point of needing to be extracted, a blacksmith or barber, skilled in fixing the problem, 
would come in instead of the dentist. Victorians used eye drops with citrus juice to keep their eyes sharp and their eyes bright. Such a procedure undoubtedly harmed the mucous membrane and burned it with acid. Women used fire hot tongs to curl their curls. More often than not, the tongs overheated and the ladies, putting them to their hair, burned their curls and were left with bald spots. Wigs were an obligatory attribute of the English. They were covered with a thick layer of grease, and the base was made of wire and wood, with wool and straw added. The wig itself was made of stiff horse hair, and the whole structure was secured with lard or grease. The top of the wig was sprinkled with poisonous lead, which had the property of accumulating in the teeth and bones. Such unthinkable towers left scars on the heads of courtiers and were often ignited by grease. There were also certain difficulties with clothing. Long crinoline skirts swept the streets. The bottoms of men's pants also quickly became dirty and untidy. But they tried to wash their clothes less often, so as not to spoil them. Maids preferred to remove stains with wax, and the unpleasant smell was eliminated with turpentine. People reeked of sweat and unwashed clothes, and their mouths reeked of rotten teeth, wrote Suskin. By the end of the 19th century, smelly liquid products similar to modern deodorants appeared in England. They were available only to wealthy ladies and men. These perfumes were poured on hair and clothes in unimaginable quantities. They masked unpleasant odors, but did not last long enough. The amber of unwashed bodies and sweat interfered with the scent of miracle products. Women's Problems Women's problems in the 19th century were solved as best they could. No one knew what intimate hygiene was. It was believed that the daily washing of the female genitalia led to infertility. Women did not wear underwear and under their skirts they had only pantaloons with a slit in the crotch area, so they could go to the bathroom without lifting many layers of clothing. During critical days, they used soft cloths wrapped around a stick. These were the predecessors of the modern tampon. A lanyard was sewn to them, by which this invention could be removed. The lanyard was usually tied to the leg. Moreover, women were inculcated with the belief that during this period they were becoming mentally handicapped and were not allowed to read anything. Higher education and mental exertion are contraindicated to women, as they can lead to infertility, so argued Professor Edward Clark people who lived in the Victorian era had a lot of distorted knowledge and skills about body cleanliness and personal hygiene. But despite the lack of sewers and plumbing and the complexities of everyday life, they tried very hard to look neat, clean, beautiful and attractive. The ladies took care of the beauty of their outfits and hairstyles. Men carefully looked after their appearance and did not allow carelessness in dress. Clean faces and hands, skillfully painted eyes for ladies and white-shaven men are worthy of respect and admiration. In such difficult times, they retained their dignity and honor. That is why films about the graceful and passionate times of the 19th century royal courtiers give us an aesthetic pleasure and a desire to watch them again and again.